Hi, everyone. Welcome to our monthly research briefing. This month, Dr. Sylvester and I are going to discuss a paper that helps us better understand gluten exposures and whether or not we actually know that they are happening. In this study, researchers looked at how much gluten people with celiac disease might eat by measuring gluten in their urine, stool, and some of the food that they ate. This study is lovingly called the doggy bag study and was led by our very own Dr. Jocelyn Sylvester at Boston Children's Hospital in partnership with her colleagues in Canada and Spain. So Dr. Sylvester, tell us about where this idea for the study came from and how it got the name the doggy bag study. That's a great question. So this is a study that our teams wanted to do for a long time because one of the questions has always been, you know, how gluten free is gluten free? And so this study came about because the technology became available to measure gluten in food, stool, and urine. And we also, in Canada, were conducting a study where we had a group of patients who'd been on a gluten-free diet for two years who we'd followed, who were also getting follow-up biopsies. And so it was a good opportunity to not only follow what was happening with the diet, but also compare that to biopsy results in two years. So tell us where the name came from. So, um, we wanted it to be doggy bag because doggy bags are the food you take home after you go to a restaurant to feed your dog. And also now that more people live in apartments and restaurants, doggy bags are also used for, you know, what happens after the food's been eaten. We didn't use bags for urine because that's just a bit messy. So we use containers. So doggy bag is actually an acronym for determination of gluten grams ingested and excreted by adults eating gluten free. Wow, that's a mouthful. So tell that's us. That's doggy bag study. <laughs> so how did your team determine if people were actually eating gluten? So we tried to go about this in many ways, using traditional methods and then also using these assays, as I mentioned. So these assays are tests that use an antibody that recognizes a part of gluten that stimulates the immune system in people with celiac disease. And so the people who participated in the study, they actually collected food samples, stool samples, and urine samples over 10 days. The food was over seven days because it was a hard sell to take a quarter of people's food for a whole 10 days. And it takes some time for the food to work through. Uh, urine was easy to get. Um, and then we had four stools over that period. So um, we tested each of these for gluten, which was kind of a gold standard. We also asked people if they thought they'd been exposed to gluten. We also had them complete standard assessments that are used, either self-recorded assessments like the celiac diet assessment tool, or um, we had a, our dietitians assess their adherence using the conventional methods that dietitians use when they see patients in clinic and a little bit more actually. That's great. So what did your team ultimately find? Can people with celiac disease completely avoid gluten? So I think we found what we were expecting, which probably wasn't the answer that our patients wanted because I think patients really are doing their best to follow a gluten-free diet and are probably eliminating gluten as much as possible. One of the things we found was that two out of every three participants had at least one positive sample over this 10 day observation period. So most patients had at least one documented gluten exposure. What we don't know is the six who we didn't see gluten, what would happen if we followed them for 14 days or 28 days or a year. And so, we suspect that everybody who's trying to follow a gluten-free diet is probably getting which because we need another time, uh, but because you can have gluten in gluten-free products, it's not surprising that we're finding gluten in a gluten-free diet. So when in these cases where you found gluten, did the people tell you that they thought they had been glutened that day? So we specifically asked people if they thought they'd been exposed to gluten and if they thought they'd had symptoms of gluten exposure, because we know that those answers can be slightly different. Okay. And what we found was a very poor correlation between people thinking they'd had gluten and people actually having gluten and an even worse correlation between us finding gluten and people thinking there was any gluten. And so what we, what we learned is that although we ask everybody in clinic, have you had any gluten exposures? Have you had any symptoms? This is actually a terrible barometer of whether or not people are getting gluten. And I think it's the hardest thing to change 
because as clinicians, we're so accustomed to asking it and we rely on our patients and our patients feel like they know when they have gluten because they feel like they know their gluten symptoms, but we really did not find a close correlation in this study. That's so interesting. So how can families use these findings in their everyday life? So I think this really reinforces what we tell our patients in clinic, which is a gluten-free diet is a best efforts thing. And the point is not to have gluten on purpose and to make the best choice that's available at the time and not to try and eradicate every last speck of gluten because that's probably impossible and probably not necessary for most patients. So I think it's really important that patients understand that we weren't surprised that two thirds of people had some detectable gluten because we know that gluten is out there. And as I mentioned earlier, there's gluten and gluten-free foods. And this doesn't mean these patients aren't adhering to their diet. It just means a gluten-free diet is hard. And so I don't think people should change their practices if they're avoiding all intentional sources of gluten based on this study. That's great. So does your team have any plans for future study or what else do you think we need to learn in this area? So one of the things we're really keen to study is what happened, what about the people who have so-called non-responsive celiac disease? So the paradigm and the belief has been that you diagnose people with celiac disease, you put them on a gluten-free diet and they get better. Now, the more we follow patients with celiac disease, the more we recognize that for children and for adults, that's not really true. And whenever we see patients with celiac disease who have persistent symptoms, the hardest thing to tease out is, is this because they're still getting gluten or is this because there's something else going on? And so non-responsive celiac disease isn't really a diagnosis, it's a classification, and then we have to figure out what the diagnosis is. So we're really keen to use these gluten detection tools to see if that helps us figure out what's happening in non-responsive celiac disease. That is so fascinating. Well, Dr. Sylvester, we really appreciate you helping us better understand this great work that you and your colleagues have done. And I'm already excited for next month's research briefing to learn more. So thanks for joining us today.